big with two G's. I'm gonna repeat that. That's big with two G's. So we back with another episode of the Big Umbrella Podcast. That's big with two G's. I'm going to repeat that. That's big with two G's, the Big Umbrella Podcast. And we got Michael Flix in the building. What's up, fam? What's going on, man? It's been a long time coming, but we actually fucking here. This is where you be. This is in your domain. Welcome. So welcome. I appreciate you even inviting us in here. It's a blessing. Thank you. I appreciate you, oh, man. Oh, my pleasure, man. I appreciate you, man. We always want to start off with what part of... Where, are you from San Diego? I'm from San Diego. There we go. So what part of San Diego are you from? Uh, It's kind of a, a, a mixed question for me. It I'm, usually be. I'm first... I got to say Southeast San Diego first. Okay. I got to say Southeast San Diego first. I actually was born in Long Beach. Mm -hmm. I came to San Diego when I was five, mm -hmm. and we came to Southeast first. Right. And as I was in Southeast from five to 13... And like I, I, okay, yeah, I, yeah, I did. That's definitely, that's yeah. It. You know what I mean? I did high school in, in North County, like the little bit of middle school and high school in North County, uh, Escondido to be specific. But I tell people, man, like I learned how to fight in Southeast. Mm. I learned to play basketball and football in Southeast. Yeah. I had my first kiss in Southeast. Like I'm, I'm. Oh, from, he remember everything. I'm it's from South, Southeast. Bro. Southeast bro. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, granted, high school was like very like formative years. Like you, you grow up, you get into your music, you start meeting girls and all of that type of stuff. And so I, I did high school in North County, so I can never like. Never say that. Like I, right. I did high school in Escondido, but I'm I'm from Southeast, bro. Right. So what was it like from from them years? I think five to thirteen. What was it like growing up for you out in Southeast? Oh man, it was the 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 early to mid nineties. It was dope. It was dope. We had, you know, I feel like at that time it was a lot more black people mm -hmm. in South. There's still a lot of black people in Southeast, but I feel like it was like eighty five percent at that time. It mm -hmm. felt like, um, but it was dope, man. Um, it's all like a bunch of like kids that were kind of into the same thing, doing the same things, playing football, playing basketball. A few of us was like, you know, trying to rap and write rhymes and do that thing. Um, but I was that was it was dope, man. I I love growing up in Southeast. I wouldn't have I wouldn't trade it for anything else. It's funny, um, like I said, I'm originally from Long Beach and all my family is from like the Long Beach and LA area. Yeah. And so growing up, whenever I would go back to like like Christmas or birthday parties or whatever and listen to all my cousins talk about like getting together for for birthdays or Christmases or whatever, I always be like, man, I wish I was in LA. I wish I was from LA. Mm -hmm. I wish I was from Long Beach. You know what I'm saying? But now that I've gotten older and I've, you know, experienced more and like, and I can have more of an appreciation of where I grew up, I'm definitely, you know, proud to say that I grew up in, in Southeast San Diego for sure. Yeah. Cause like you said before, you was like, man, I wish I could be like, man, I'm from LA. I'm, yeah. from, I'm from Long Beach. Yeah, but it's yeah. like, no, like now. I'm glad to say I'm from Dago. And, and, you know, because L.A. is dope. You know what I mean? Right. LA, L.A. is a really, really... And I lived in L.A. Uh, in 2009 for almost a year. L.A. is a really, really dope place. And then when that's when you're originally born, you know what I mean? And then all your cousins are there. Right. You know what I mean? It's like... It like just makes you really you, like yeah, I got like, a real stamp. Like, yeah, I'm real. It make I you feel like here. It's like... It make you feel like... Not like you fake it, but almost make you feel like you're not where you're supposed to be. I felt like that a lot growing up. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm... Living in Southeast, but I felt like I'm supposed to be in LA or Long Beach. Like I'm supposed to be out there. That's how I felt growing up. But like I said, you get older. Early you, on, what made you feel like you were supposed to be out there? Just because I knew that's where I was born mm -hmm. and that's where all my cousins were. Oh, okay. And I like I have friends out here and like I have some some friends, some lifelong friends that I'm still friends with to this day. But you know, like Ain't nothing like your cousins. You know what I'm saying? Oh, 100%. Your, your cousins, are, I mean, your siblings for sure, but like your your cousins are like your first friends. You know what I'm saying? And for me, like, I think my cousins are dope. I've always like been really, really close to my cousins. Yeah, you know same here. Saying? I definitely, I'm mad close. To you my know cousins. what I'm saying? And so, and so like when you go and back- most of my cousins is females. Oh, okay, okay. Oh, yeah, yeah. And see, it's it's the opposite for me. Yeah. Like all my cousins, is, I'm I'm one of like 20 something grandkids. Oh, grand, like grandkids, but boys yeah, though. Yeah, see, it's like all the boys. Opposite. Mine is opposite of that. And so you can imagine it being all boys. And when I go to LA oh, for a birthday or a Christmas out. or a Thanksgiving, and everybody's talking about like, oh, Thursday at school or last month at somebody's birthday or remember last Thanksgiving. And it would be so much, so many stories that I would like miss out on. I'd be like, no, I'm so I'm supposed to be there for that. Mm -hmm. Like I I like I like San Diego. I love San Diego, but I feel like I'm supposed to be in LA experiencing what my cousins are experiencing. I'm supposed to be so with my cousins. Definitely more so it's like when it came to like the family experiences. I should have been in LA yeah. with the family experience, yeah. but you know, outside of that, it's, it's cool. I'm here in San Diego, absolutely. But, but it's like when I, when it involves my family, I definitely wanted to be involved. Absolutely, in 
Yeah, so I, I definitely see what what what, what, what would make you even like feel like mm-hmm. I definitely I need to be out there, mm-hmm. but it was like more so I want to connect with my family exactly because it's like it ain't nothing like family and like you said your cousin like these are my first best friends mm-hmm. so it was like yeah, you had it, that connection exactly and you know to be clear it wasn't like necessarily like a school that I wanted to go to or like I wanted to be in the mall right. that they were at or like a park in LA that it wasn't, it wasn't LA like specifically. It was just that, like you said, my cousins were there and I know that's where I was born. So mm-hmm. I felt like that's where I was supposed to be. Right. Uh, yeah. What was it like growing up for you in uh, San Diego? Did you have both of your, your mom and your dad? Yeah. Okay. My parents are still married to this day. Oh man, that's, that's a blessing. Like Absolutely I, I, I always say that, like that's a blessing. I mean, Absolutely. no matter, I mean, everybody knows it's ups and downs. What was it like growing up? Did you have siblings? Yeah, I'm, I'm in the middle. I got an older brother and a younger brother. Okay, so what was it like growing up for you with your mom and your dad early it, on? It was dope. It was really good, man. Um, my dad would always, my dad would always tell my brothers and I, "You got you boys don't realize how blessed you are to have both parents in the house." He would always say that. And as a kid, like you, of course, you hear it and you you know it's true, right? But for me, and I've and I've said this on my podcast a couple of times, my friends that their parents were split up. They had two bedrooms, two bikes, two playstations. Mm, everything two, in two. Like they had everything in two. So I felt like the the, the the lit life is having your parents split up so you can have two of everything. But as a kid, you know, you know, of like, course. that's obviously naive to think. But as a kid, that's how I felt. Like all right. my friends that got their parents in Because you're thinking of like the the stuff, oh man, I could get all two this, Two Christmases, bro? two birthdays, two I bikes. I get all two, this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Instead of even thinking a bigger picture like... You getting that, but it come with a price. Exactly, it come exactly. with a price. So yeah, I had like I have I had both parents growing up and um, grew up in a Christian house. My dad's a minister. My dad's been a minister my entire life, um, and so like I, you know grew grew up in a Christian household. Both parents in the house. Um, it was dope. I I very much appreciate the the upbringing that I had for sure. With that Christian lifestyle, did you feel like that was forced upon you, or I mean, with you being as a kid, maybe I mean I don't know if you even realize it or not, did you feel like you growing up, it was like, this is what it's supposed to be? Or if I go left of this, I'm doing bad? Um, I never felt like it was forced. Like thinking back, I, you could say it was forced because we didn't, we didn't have a choice. On Sunday, we were going to be in church. Right. Um, I, 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 I tell people, unless I was away like with my cousins in LA for like for the summer right. or like at basketball camp or something, I can count on my hands how many times I missed church on a Sunday. Mm, so it was real. Like, actually was on like, one hand, actually. It's like, I'm going to be there. We didn't miss church, bro. Mm. And so like in that sense, I guess you could say it was forced because we didn't have a church. We had to, um, we didn't have a choice. Right. We had to go to church, but it never felt forced. Mm. It never, it never one time felt forced. My parents definitely made sure like we knew, you know, what it meant to be a Christian um, they made sure we knew how to pray and, you know, certain things like that. But it never, it never felt forced. It never felt like, it, it I, ne- I never felt like I wanted to, I never felt like I wanted to do anything differently. Mm-hmm. Like I wasn't like this super devout Christian right. either. I wasn't like, I, I consider myself a Christian now right. and I'm not super devout now, but even growing up, I, I didn't consider myself like a super devout Christian, but I never thought about not like doing that or doing, doing that. Yeah, I exactly. never thought about doing anything differently. And so it was never a thought that like if I stop going to church is is like there's going to be some type of rebellion or like if I choose another religion is it going to be some type of rebellion? Those just weren't weren't thoughts that I had. Mm-hmm. Like so for me it was always like I go to church, I'm a Christian. This is just what this is just what we do. Right. So so with you being the middle child, mm-hmm. did you feel like your your siblings more so brought you up or you had to take on more of the both of things? I was the mediator. Right. And I was that's the mediator. It. I was the mediator. Um I have and me and me and I have great relationships with both my younger and my older brother. And they have great relationships and we all get along very well. Oh, you got brothers? Yeah, it's okay. just it's just yeah. three boys. Mm-hmm. It's three boys. Um but gr- growing up, I definitely I definitely was the mediator. I've always been really, really close to both my brothers, but growing up they weren't necessarily the closest. They mm-hmm. didn't like it wasn't like some big like crazy thing going right, on but course. they had like a thing like my my older brother was always a more of the type that like he kind of wants to just do his own thing he wants to be left alone mm-hmm. like you know what i mean you come in his room hang out with him a little bit he really just for the most part wanted to be left alone and then my little brother he's he's a little brother he wants to be around his older siblings right, you know exactly. what I mean? and i was the older sibling and i was like come on man you can kick it mm-hmm. my older brother was like it's like a 
almost a five year gap between them. So it was like 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 watch out, fam. Yeah, you know he, he's I mean? he's a little young. Shit. Yeah, you like, know what I mean. So we so we don't need of, him around right now. Exactly. So a lot of the time, I, I played played the mediator with them. Um, but no, nah, I never felt like the need to try to like, like fight, like fight or compete with my older brother. I I definitely felt as a middle child, I definitely felt overlooked, mm-hmm. overlooked and forgotten a mm-hmm. lot of the time. Um, I was a mama's boy, so my mom did a pretty good job of like, I knew my mom, I knew both my parents loved me. Let me mm-hmm. make that clear. Um, but my mom would like, because I, she and I were so close because I was of her three sons, I was the mama's boy. Mm-hmm. And so because of that. That's me. I'm I'm super tight with my mom. I mean, that's that's all. I, that's all I got anyway. But I mean, I'm I'm like, like mm-hmm. that. I feel mom. It. Same. No, no lie. Like Same. that's mom. Same. I'm like that for real. Moms be hitting me up with stuff now. Like, and I'll be, I'll be, I was just oh, talking about talking my podcast. This day. Like, like I was thinking about. I was driving home from like L.A. or something like that. And I was just thinking about something, and I had something I had never mentioned to anybody, and I was just thinking it. And then the next morning, my mom called me, like telling me exactly what I was just thinking about on the way home from LA the next morning. I'm like, "Mom's just be knowing, bro." Oh yeah, mom's just be knowing. But um, yeah, I was like the 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 mediator between them. I was really I was really close with my mom. Um, but like I said, as a middle child, I definitely felt like like overlooked and forgotten, and like felt like a lot of the time the stuff that I was doing, like I was made to do things that my brothers didn't have to do. So when you say you felt overlooked, was it felt you felt overlooked more so? With both parents, or you felt more overlooked with your pops? Good question. I've always just said overlooked, and I've never really thought about... That's what just made me think, because I know you said how close you is with your mom, so that made me think, like, was it more so overlooked by your pops, or it was a dual duality of both? Nah, just overlooked in general. Just overlooked in general. Um, Like, my older brother, like, because he's the firstborn, like, say he turns... Like say he turns thirteen, it's like right. oh he's a teenager now. Right. Let's throw a big party. Right. And when I thirteen, when I turned thirteen, it's yeah, like oh, we already did that. Hmm. We did that. And then what happens for my little brother? It's like the baby he's is the thirteen. Baby. Right. You know what I'm saying? So for right. me, it was like why well, didn't? How come I didn't get the thirteen? Same thing when he turned party. ten. It was like oh he's double digits. It's like uh, Mike's remember, birthday. I was, I was double digits. And, and to be clear, my birthday was celebrated. Mm. My birthday was celebrated. Right. But like for them, it was like yo, like you, because you see the difference yeah. from. When it was my older brother's birthday at 10 or 13, they was wilding yeah, for him. Yeah. But when it was my and my youngest birthday, mm-hmm. they was going everything mm-hmm. from they yeah. doing they going all out. Yes. But when it was mine, it was like, oh, you know, yeah. you know it, it's cool. The exactly. You know, but you know, it ain't it ain't the youngest or the oldest. And then also my dad, like of course, like was, you know, we we lived in a house, we had a front yard and a backyard, a lot of stuff to uh, to do around the house. Um I'm like outside and around the house, I mean. That's that's already another plus. A front yard in the backyard. That already sounds exactly. that already sound nice. Yeah. <laughs> and then my uh like my older brother was the type that like he would put up a fuss like when you ask him to do stuff. Mm-hmm. And I was the type that if my mom and dad asked me to do something, I would just jump up and do it. Mm-hmm. And because of that, because my dad didn't really want the, the fuss. fuss, he would just ask me to do it. Right. And it turned into he would just ask me to do no, everything. doing everything. You know what I'm saying? And I remember I called him like, bro, why I got to do everything? Like, why you don't ask these two to do everything? My dad like finally had to sit me down one day and was like, I'm I'm sorry. Like, I do ask you to do everything. It was because I know if I ask you, I know it's going to get done. Like, I know if I ask the other two, I don't know. Like, they're going to take their time. They might drag their feet. But I know if I ask you, it's going to get done. Mm-hmm. So that's why I ask you. It is a little bit unfair. And I'm going to I'm gonna cool off a little bit. But just so you know, that is why I come to you. Because I know you're going to get it done the way I need you to get it done. Did that make you feel more like? Like, you know, oh, okay. Or did it make me still like, okay, he kind of taking advantage of me with this? No, I never felt, I guess I kind of felt taken advantage of, but I like, I kind of felt like, oh, that's dope. Like you look to me like, right, that's why I asked you know, that. I can handle things. But on the other hand, it was like, I'm getting tired so of So what? They here too. Yeah. They got arms and legs yeah, just yeah, like me. Exactly. If not longer or shorter, yeah. like they can still do all yeah. this shit that I'm doing. Absolutely. Yeah. As long as you tell them for reals and really be like, yo. Yeah. Get on that. Yeah. Then yeah. they gonna do the same thing mm-hmm. I just did. Yeah. I just didn't have no problem doing it. That's mm-hmm. that's really what it was. Exactly. Worked. Exactly. So like, oh, you saw like you said. So it was more so on both. So when did you feel like you end up getting closer with your pops? Um, me and my dad have always been close. Mm-hmm. Um, I I can't say I've ever felt like there was a time when we weren't close. Like mm-hmm. I've always no, that's a, super dope. Had a really really solid relationship. With, I mean, I've never, I'm a mama's boy, so I've always been closer to my mom, mm-hmm. but I've never felt like Straight my dad away. and I, nah, nah, I never felt like my dad and I weren't closer, that we needed to work on our relationship or anything. I definitely feel like we got closer when I became an adult. Like, I remember, like, specifically, like, like, speaking to him and him speaking to me, 
like a man and us having like conversations like as men. And like not, he not talking to me like not as a, I'm child, a child and not as his son. He knows I have an opinion. We're speaking as men right now. And I remember like, and it wasn't like anything that he was purposely doing. It was just like, this is the level that we're at now. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? I remember even being in the conversation. And you probably showed that earlier on. Like you said, like if I ask you, I know it's going to get done. Mm-hmm. That's like a low key, like that's probably, he already thought of you in that sense early mm-hmm. on. But now it's like, this is coming to f- full fruition. It's mm-hmm. like, now I see this is the man that I already knew. That's a good point. I never thought about it like that. Yeah. That's a good point. Because he already was already putting everything on you. Mm-hmm. And that's what you do to mm-hmm. what you feel as a man or mm-hmm. somebody coming up as a man. Mm-hmm. So he was already throwing this shit on you. Mm-hmm. And now seeing you, like you said, that conversation, you could continue with that. That conversation you had when you felt like he was talking to another man. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, I, I remember like. I, like I, and it's funny. Like I remember, like that feeling, and like sitting and looking at him, like yo, like he talking to me like a man right now. Like mm. it kind of like made me like my chest stick up right. a little bit. You know what I mean? Oh, but shit. I can't, I can't think of me. exactly what we were talking about. But I just remember he was like, okay, so now let me ask you this, and just like the way he said, now let me ask you this, and the way he went about asking me the question, it was just on a, a level that we had never conversed before, mm-hmm. and I could just, I could feel the difference in like. I don't want to like sound like that, but like he he knows he's speaking to like, he know, obviously knows he's speaking to his son, but like right. he knows he's speaking to a man, now, right? You know what I mean? One hundred percent. It was a good feeling for sure. Definitely, I'm sure. Like that, like you said, that made me feel like mm-hmm. shit. Yeah. You know, that's hey, okay. Yeah. What got you into doing sports? And what was your first love? My first love was, um, I want to say music. No, 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 no. My first love was music. Okay. My first love was music. I've been um. Like I said, we grew up in the church. I played the drums for the choir mm-hmm. in church growing up. So uh, music was definitely my first love. I sang in the choir a little bit, only man, because- I always tell everybody, man, if I could sing, I wouldn't be doing this shit. Fam, I could I, sing I'm, just, I, I say that all the time too. I could sing just a little bit. Man. Like some people like, I could carry a note. I could do a little bit more than carry a note, but I'm definitely not good enough to like be trying to find a studio to record no yeah. music. Definitely. Hey, um, have you ever tried though? I used to rap. I used no, to rap with the singing. No, part. no, no. I never, never recorded hey, myself singing. Hey, <laughs> it might be time. You might be due. You might be due. Oh no, I might have to take some singing lessons for hey. that. Hey, nah, nah, nah. But um, man, I forgot what I was saying. Now you was talking about when you was in church, and then you was yeah. So choir. um, I was I was already in the choir, and I remember like I started playing the drums, so I didn't have to sing, mm-hmm. and so I didn't have to sit next to my mom. During church, because like I said, we were going to be in church regardless. Right. At least and now so, you're doing something you get to enjoy. Right. And I remember it. like sitting with my mom and like just, I've always like the music always intrigued me. Like, mm. you know, as a kid, like the the preaching is like, that's whatever. It almost feels like school. It's like the right. teacher up there talking. That's whatever. Exactly. The music though is like, that's when oh, you could really like a whole day. Okay. They, oh, okay, they doing cool. their thing up there. And for me, like for whatever reason, the drums caught my eye or the beat caught my ear or whatever. But I remember just like, I'll be fixated on the drummer the whole time. And I remember I asked my mom one day, like, hey, can I go sit up there? And she was like, what you want to sit up there for? I was like, so I could just watch him play. And she was like, How yeah. old was you? If you could remember then. Um... Eight or nine? Oh damn! Yeah. Okay, so you were like, you was really into like, I don't, I don't mm-hmm. see what he really doing up there. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. He did a like I said, I was already like like watching because I've always been like intrigued with music. But I remember one day he just he he did a roll one day and it just looked and it was one of those things where like no saxophone, no piano, like it's just a drummer in his bag and he did like he low key had a solo yeah really and he did and he did a run and he did his thing and I was like yo that was dope that was dope and I remember asking my mom like yo can I go sit up there. And she's like, what you want to sit up there next to him for? I was like, so just to, wa- just to watch him play. She was like, yeah, go ahead. I was like, oh, and I didn't think she would say yeah. Mm-hmm. But I ended up going, sitting up there, and just like, I would just watch, like, literally, like, the drummer's two feet away from me. I'm sitting right next to him, just watching him do everything. And this is during, like, a church sermon. This is during church service, yeah. yeah. This is during the service where, yeah. the, like, the, the praise and worship, the choir, everything. I'm sitting right, right next to him while he's playing until... Like maybe like a year and a half later, I got my I got my chance to play, and I got up there, hit the. I mean, I never forget, bro. I got up there, and I like I could before you got up there. Did you already have practice, or you? This is you going. The only practice I had was like after church, when nobody's really paying right. attention. You know what I'm saying? Like the drummer will leave his sticks on the snare drum, oh. and the church is clearing out, and I'm already sitting there anyway, and I would just jump on and try to mm-hmm. try to do some things. And I'm thinking I'm nice already. Yeah. I'll never forget when I got my first chance to play. I couldn't uh, like for people like people that's in the music and drummers would know, but there's like a a, a foot bass. There's a yeah, foot pedal. That, you know what I'm that saying? Thing that be slapping on there. Yeah, yeah. And I, I couldn't keep rhythm with that 
and my hands Angle. at the same. Because people don't like when you play the drums, you got one foot, potentially two feet, and two hands, all four extremities doing different things when you play the drums. Mm. You know what I'm saying? And so I couldn't, but this drum set I was on, it was just one foot pedal, but you still got both your hands. Right. But I couldn't like keep a good rhythm doing all three. So I just leave the foot pedal alone and just do And this it. is live. This is live. Uh-huh. And I'm playing just no bass, just snare and hi-hat. And I remember the choir director like turned and looked at me and was like, like, where that like, like, what, like <laughs> what are you doing? Like to the point where like she like wait, like there was another dude sitting up there too, like like waving me off, like, no, let him play. Like, let him play. Like to the like one of those. <laughs> like it was it was bad, but I kept <sighs> I kept practicing, kept practicing, kept practicing. And the main drummer at the church, he bought me like a little, like a little practice drum to take home and practice. Gave me a pair of drumsticks, a set of drumsticks, and bought me like a little practice drum to take home and practice with. And I took that home and would practice on that. But still, there's no foot pedal. Exactly. Y'all. So I would take home and, and practice with that. And I finally got to the point where I would just, and we had wood floors at home, so I would just like hit the wood floor mm-hmm. pretty hard to get that. You know what I'm saying? And keep practicing with that. Oh, so I finally you got good dedicated. Enough. Yeah, man. I, I really yeah. wanted to play. Like it looked too cool up there. I really mm-hmm. wanted to play. And I finally got to the point where I was good enough to where I could I could you know do everything and like fully fully play the drums. I was probably like nine or ten when I finally like when I finally got it. Hey, that was early on. So like yeah. that that's a big accomplishment to already be like full on in the drums at nine and ten. Like mm-hmm. that's big. Appreciate it. So then what you then then you went to music. What then brought you to playing uh, sports? Well, I was. I was playing sports before doing music. I just didn't necessarily love to play sports. Like I was, I've always been outside playing basketball in the street. We actually had the the telephone pole uh, basketball court where you nail the uh, the bike with the take the spokes out yeah. and nail it up on the telephone pole. We okay. had that was that was our first hoop. Um, and we you know uh, sideline pop um, playing two hand touch in the street. So I've, I was always I playing two hand touch in the street. Yeah, I was always playing football and basketball. I played uh, my first. My first time, my first time playing organized basketball was for the in, in Canto Rec Center. Played one season there, and then we played the rest of our time at at the MLK Rec Center. Um, so yeah, I, I was playing, I was playing basketball and T ball. Football came a little later. But I was playing basketball and T ball before, way before I picked up a set of drumsticks. But I just didn't really love it. I just did it because I was kind of good at it. I was pretty fast. My brother played, everyone in our neighborhood played, and I was like, I'm pretty good, might as well play. But I didn't, I can't say I loved it. Mm-hmm. I can't say I loved My first love was music for sure. I, I grew a love, like I love basketball, like I love basketball now. But that didn't grow until I was maybe like like 13 or 14 maybe. Mm-hmm. Music was definitely my first love for sure. So what made you then, I don't, I don't know if you have or not, but what made you kind of stray away from music? Um... Good question, man. Nobody's ever asked me that. I got like you said, that was your first love, and uh-huh. it's like I don't, I don't know what made you be like, okay, you know what? Maybe this, this is not it. I, I got discouraged and 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 a little turned off after I came back. I said I lived in L.A. for a year in two thousand nine. Right. Yeah, when I, I went to L.A. to study music, I went to L.A. to go to uh, Cerritos College. They had a, a a music production and a radio. <laughs> In a radio production program at Cerritos College. Okay. Um, and funny enough, that like a radio production thing, like now I do all this this radio and broadcasting exactly. now. Um, but I went out there mainly for music. Like right. I was doing the radio things. I was like, oh, radio would be dope. If I learn music and learn radio, there'd be two different jobs that I could do. I could do music on the radio or off the radio. But I wasn't really necessarily interested in doing radio back then. I just knew it would be a potential like way to make money. I got it under my belt. Right. And, and then I took the class and I was like, oh, no, doing radio is pretty dope. Right. Um, I only took I only took two classes from one semester, so I didn't really do much. But anyway, I moved to LA to study music. Um, I like I said, I, I was rapping, making beats here and there. I play the piano by ear, and I play the drums. So I was really like heavily into music. You in there? Moved to Cerrito to Cerritos to study music, and just like my living situation at the time was real like it was real sticky. I didn't have much. I was like didn't have much money. Um, my, my trip to him, like my, my ride from, from where I was living to school was almost two hours one way. That hurt. You know what I mean? And so like, didn't really, one way. didn't really have no money, didn't really have much food to eat. And then that, that commute was killing me. So them circumstances were really, yeah, I, I guess you could say I just didn't have the, the, the grind to stick it out. Cause it's people that have like dealt with worse to get to their goals. Of course. You know what I'm saying? So mm-hmm. I guess I just didn't have the, the grind to to stick it out. But it was just it was just a little bit too much. Like it really really the main thing was my living situation, mm-hmm. honestly. My living situation was just too like, uh, 
So I, I can't that. do this and that exactly. with this. It's like, okay. Exactly. Something got to, I got to give, give up. Exactly. On, on something. And so I came back to San Diego, still loving music, but at that point, like, like all my connections here in San Diego were still here. Like the, the where I was, like the studios I was using were still there. Um, like my friends that made, the majority of my friends that made music, actually most of them had left. Maybe one or two of them were still here. But I was just turned off. Like I still had the outlets. I still could have if I wanted to. I was just really discouraged. Mm-hmm. I was just really discouraged, a little bit depressed, honestly, if I th- when I think back to it. And that was really what what took me away from music. I came back to San Diego, took a job um, at an after-school program, um, and got back into coaching basketball. And that was really like what took off from there. Like I kind of, dang, it kind of like it's sad to say it out loud. Now I've never said it out loud, but I kind of at that point, the end of two thousand nine, kind of left creating music. I still love music. I still listen to music, um, but at that point, left creating music alone and dove into dove into sports, specifically coaching. And that's not necessarily something negative. That might have been the blessing that was supposed to come your way. Because, like, I mean, I always say, like, to myself, like, God don't make mistakes. So it was for a reason why that happened. But I, I wanted to ask about <clears throat> with the music thing, if you were to still be doing music, what realm of music would you have wanted to be doing? Like, would you want it to be on the producing side? Would you want it to have been on the instrumentals? You actually doing live music? Would you want to have been rapping? Singing, like, what would you have still, if you were still pursuing music, what would you have wanted to, the realm of what you wanted to be pursuing? I wanted to, I really wanted to produce. Like I said, I was rapping, and I I, I put songs out, and, and it's funny, I said I wanted to produce. I never put any beats out, never try to sell a beat. I would make them all the time, but never try to give them to anybody, never try to sell them. Um, a good question. I would be in the production. I would be in production. Because I enjoy writing rhymes, and I enjoy like going to the studio to record my rhymes. But like just thinking like what I do now, like in a, I, I'm on camera now, obviously. But just like a lot of what I do is behind the camera. So I think, I think the way it would have panned out for me, I would have been a production, like a behind the scenes guy. Right. If I, if I stayed with it. Yeah. Yeah. Looking back now, and maybe even thinking on it now, it's like, is that something that is still being a works or that's that's done for well, you? It is, <clears throat> I, I definitely still get the itch. I definitely still get the itch. Quiet as it's kept, I do feel inspired from time to time to write rhymes. But it never like it never turns into anything. Like I'll like when um uh when Meek Mill's uh championships album came out. Okay. The What's Free song with with Jay-Z and Rick Ross. Mm-hmm. That like I went on YouTube and downloaded that beat and started writing to it. And like I would I would take like 20, 25, and I've never told anybody this. Like I haven't wrote rhymes since 2009. I've never told anybody this. Like I downloaded that beat and would be writing to it and be writing to it. Like I don't really like this. I come up with a couple bars that I like and be like, I put it away, a little writer's cramp, come back to it the next day. And was trying to put a verse together, but it was just, it just wouldn't come to me. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I'm taking the time to do this when I could be. Filming a basketball game, I could be playing with footage to get better at editing. I could be booking an interview. Like I'm kind of taking away from what I truly want to grow at to put time into something that I've kind of already left alone. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? So that was, but yeah, I, I still dabble in it from time. See, to time. then that make you think: Did you really leave it alone? Because like you said, like there be times I be getting that itch. Like man, I want to lay something down. So it's like. Did you for real leave it alone, or is it something that's still trying to make its way back out and be like, you know what? I de- I definitely left it alone. I guess the question is, did I leave it alone for good? And I think the answer to that is probably not. Of course not. And and probably for good, not. that means forever. And it's yeah. like it's no telling any type of situation you go through in life, and then be like, okay, I went through this, and now I actually want to put something down mm-hmm. on, on on a track or something like that, or produce something for the beat or whatever. Mm-hmm. So it's like, of course, you can never say like, oh no, I'm done forever, because mm-hmm. it's like. You just never know what's gonna come your right. way. I might, I might catch them off guard, man. I might, you know, I might, cause I got friends that that write rhymes and make music. I might be like, hey, man, leave leave a sixteen for me, man. I'm gonna come to the studio. And a whole sixteen. Like I mean, I, I've done it before. I don't yeah. see why I wouldn't be able to do it again. Yeah. And then, and then, and then, honestly, at this point, like I said, I get writer's block all the time. But like at this point, I've I've lived like I haven't wrote rhymes since I was. I think you said oh nine. 
since I was 20. And I'm mm. 30. This has been 14 years. Mm. You know what I'm saying? So I've lived so much life. I've experienced so much. So it could only, the writing would only be better at this point. Right. Because you know like you said, saying? the experience, you know now what, what you have so. went through in the past is like, I got mm-hmm. so much I could mm-hmm. actually talk about. And I do still write. Like I write, um, it's actually how I, why I, pardon me, why I bought a camera for the first time. Like I wrote a short story. Mm-hmm. And I was like, hey, you know what? This would be dope as a movie. This would be a dope short film. And so I got a camera and started trying to like make it a short film, but the the images that I was seeing in my head, I wasn't able to create. So I was, I was just like, about to ask what happened with the short film because myself, like I'm, I really, I, I so, enjoy. So I wrote, I wrote, I wrote, I write all the time. I don't always write rhymes, but I always write. Mm-hmm. Whether I'm like journaling my thoughts, a short story, I write all the time. Um, but I wrote this short story that I would like really, really liked that I was like really in love with. Got a what camera. was the short story about? It was about, do I want to say? Hey, that's, that's all up to you. Do I want to say? That is all up to you. Yeah, I'll say. It was, yeah, because, yeah. It was about, like, just a homeless dude, a homeless guy that- Have you ever been homeless? No, I've never been homeless. Okay. I've never been homeless. Okay. So this, this has uh, no reference to you? No. Okay. Okay. Um. Thank, thank, thank God I've Definitely. never been homeless. Definitely. Um, but it was about a homeless guy- Trying to get like trying to like find a job and get back on his feet. Doing okay, doing what he has to do. For, we take that for whatever it's worth. A homeless guy doing what he has to do to get back on his feet. Get a to get a, a homeless guy doing what he has to do to get a job and get back on his feet. Low key like the pursuit of happiness. Yeah, but in pursuit of happiness, like he already had. I, I don't want to say a corporate job, but he already had a job where he had to put a right. suit on and go sell something. Yeah. In my in my short story, this is like a homeless dude, no job. Oh, okay. He don't have a suit. He got a. He got this out. a dirty jacket and some job. ripped sweatpants and some sandals. Like mm-hmm. he don't have nothing. You know what I'm saying? Right. And so like it was basically like he. I didn't even go get a story away in case I end up shooting one. I want to steal my steal my. Definitely, idea. definitely. Um, but yeah, it was that, that that was what it was about? And I I shot the first like two or three scenes, took it home to edit, and it was just like, bro, like I nah. And I'm not I'm not the perfectionist type. I'm the type that like, if you want to do something, just start. Because if you keep putting all this thought and trying to make it perfect, you're never gonna put anything oh, never. out. And so like, but with that though, I was like, I was just looking at it like, bro, there's there's no like nah, like I can't edit this and put it out and try to nah nah. What but, what what made you say no though? I didn't know anything like, and I still got a lot to learn. I'm not I'm not anything like uh, you're you're amazing producer that we have today. Mm-hmm. Um, but. I still have a lot to learn about like lighting and like ISOs and the settings on cameras and everything. But at that point, I knew nothing about nothing and I didn't know how to adjust or change anything. And you don't always have to be working by yourself. There's other people who know those type of things and would love to work with you. Facts. But at that time, right. I was all like, really like how I, how I do my shows now. Like mm-hmm. I don't really... I don't really ask... Like when I, when I shoot my shows, I don't ask anybody like, hey bro, can you come do the cameras for me? Can you do the audio for me? I just... Mm-hmm. Set everything up, hit record, and I come sit down and do it. And I was the same way. I was the same way I was shooting my short film. Mm-hmm. I would just go out a camera, put it on a tripod, and was like, I kind of want the angle to be right here. And so I would like, this is really what I would do, bro. Like I would set the camera up, hit record, like go walk in front of it, kind of like do like a mock version of the scene, mm-hmm. and then watch it back and make sure like my whole body was in the frame and make sure everything, you know what I'm saying? And like right. set it up that way. And then go do that. Like if it wasn't right, adjust it and then set it up and then really go do the real one. And so like, to your point, yeah, there was people to help, but at that, I wasn't really thinking like that. I was mm-hmm. like, this is what I want to do. I'm going to go do it. But yeah, it just wasn't, it didn't look the way I wanted or needed needed it to look. And so I never, I never did it. I don't even have that footage. Yet. I wish I still had it, honestly. Well, but you still got the thoughts. I definitely still got the thoughts. So it's going to get shot. Like I'm saying, that might be something you might want to come back around to. Like, and now you got a different perspective on things. It's like, now you got other people you can work with. So exactly. it's like, exactly. that could be, even if somebody else, if you wanted them to shoot that, I mean, act for that scene or whatever the mm-hmm. case is, it's like, now you got other outlets you can. Oh, it's you know. going to happen. And see now, now I'm, I'm more on like, not more on like, but I've written other short stories and now I want like, for whatever reason, I want to be the homeless person in that short film. Mm-hmm. But like some of the other things that I've written, like it's, it's for other people to be on camera and I just want to be behind the camera. Right. Like right. I just want to shoot. This yeah. one specific. But that, I, don't, I don't know why, but maybe it's because it's the first one that I wrote that I right. like, that I really like. And you really feeling that. Yeah. And that's what's like, nah, I want to. 
you believe in it. I need to be the homeless dude in that. But all the other ones that I've written, it's like it's nice for other people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. What got you into so, writing so deeply? Like you said, you write no matter what, even if it's if it's rap, if it's just journalism. Like, what got you into wanting to write so much? No one's ever asked me that, but I know the exact answer to that question. My second grade teacher at Valencia Park Elementary in Southeast, shout out to Southeast, my second grade teacher at Valencia Park Elementary, Miss Fulcher. Every, um, we had to write in her class all the time. She was big into poetry, um, big into writing. Um, we had to write, I think in high school is when you start writing like the one pagers, like you gotta like write like the one pagers. We were in second grade and she would make us, you know, <laughs> remember the big like gray sheets of paper with the blue <laughs> lines on them? It was like the solid lines and the dotted line in the middle. She would take the full page of one of those though, the full page of one of those, and we had to write a half page. No matter what it was, we had to write, had to write a, to that dotted line. We had to write a half page every mm -hmm. day. And I guess with that, I just fell in love with writing. Mm -hmm. And just with that, and and she was big into poetry. Um, she made our entire class memorized the um the I am somebody speech. I'm not familiar with it. You still know it to this day? Um I know bits and pieces of right, it. I don't know, sure. I don't know it from start to from start to mm -hmm. finish. But she was big into poetry. Um she got me like she made me fall in love with um with reading honestly. Like she put us onto the like the goosebump books. Oh man, I remember yeah. that, that and that was a yeah. series of them going forever. Exactly. My niece and nephew be watching them on Netflix now. Great. See, and yeah. then back in the day, you wasn't watching no TV. This is like you have to yeah. read had these goofball books for exactly. reals. Exactly. You had to be lucky That's to like crazy. hopefully go cop the cop the not even the DVD, the VHS. Exactly. <laughs> at Blockbuster or something. But yeah, Man, set my Blockbuster. My, That's crazy. That's yeah. a whole other thing right there. <laughs> but yeah, my, my second grade teacher, Miss Fulcher, is is I credit her to my love for uh my love for writing and you know, my, my my love for literature altogether mm -hmm. is from my second grade teacher, Miss Fulcher, for mm -hmm. sure. And now with that love for literature, that has taken you to, that just blossomed you to w way more than just writing this alone. Like you said, like you do broadcasting, radio, like doing with the sports and everything. Like, so that was a real big up to her for, to, I mean, hopefully she knows that she even inspired you to do and to be where you at, where you are today. She, do she doesn't know specifically, but I'm sure she knows that she inspired a lot of the kids that she taught. I went back. Um, to my elementary school because I, I mean, like I, I live in Southeast now, right? Um, and I went, um, I went back to my elementary school just to visit, just you know, and but she, she's not working anymore. My right. one, only one of my old teachers was still there, and he, 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 he didn't obviously he didn't recognize me. I look, I look different, right? But when I told him my name, he, he was like, "Now nah, that name sounds really familiar." And coincidentally, um, my. So I was I went to performing arts elementary school. Valencia Park, I don't know if it still is to this day, but in the 90s, Valencia Park was a performing arts elementary school. So you was already intrigued by the entertainment industry. Well, see, I, I went there just because it was the school that was that I was in my neighborhood. Oh, okay, okay. okay. It wasn't like okay. I wanted to pursue right. it, but just it was something that I really it was the low-key destined. Really, I really enjoyed. Like yeah. it was it was for it was a what was it? How, how do they say it? It was a Valencia Park for academics, drama, and dance. Mm -hmm. And so it was like acting and dancing at this school. Like right. it was almost like it was elementary elementary kids, but you one of those was gonna be an elective for you. Like for like a month and a half, maybe two months out of the year, for 30 minutes, 45 minutes out of the day, you would grow, go to the drama teacher's class and learn to mime and learn to act and learn to Was it like a black box? Nah. Okay. Nah, I, was, I had one like that in, in high school. That's why I asked. What do you mean a black box? What so do you mean? it was like the they had this room and it was just it, the room was like painted all black everywhere. So it was like it just looked dark, but and that's where they had you do your acting. Oh no, nah, and see, <clears throat> and I think because it was a performing arts school and it was like a concerted, like a concentrated effort on performing arts. Right. Our drama classes were like full on like a um it was a bungalow, so it'd be like like similar to this. Obviously, the audience can't see the whole room, but it'll be similar to this room. Right. But maybe like where the bag starts, right there, there was a stage, like a like a, a stage. Right. Where like we would all sit and like whoever was had on to go, stage. you had to go like up on, on the stage. stage in front, of, and there was curtains, everything. Right. Same thing. My bad, bro. Same thing with the with the dance classes too. It was like similar to this room, like a bit. Wooden, they want to set it up for you to perform. Floors, 
mirrors on the wall, like the the the, the bar, like in a dance room, like it was like full on, mm -hmm. like full on, and like and even like some of the like I, I've I've spoken to different people like like auditioning for their their school plays and stuff like that. They were like, oh, like we got in, like they put me in, they let me be a tree, and like I didn't have any lines, but they dressed me up as a tree, and I got to be in a play. Valencia Park wasn't like that. Like you had to audition in front of all 100 kids that were also auditioning. And if you weren't good enough, you didn't make it, bro. Right. And all everyone that made it knew and everyone that didn't knew. So if you didn't make it, you just didn't make it, bro. It Did was you have to audition? Yeah. Every year. Every single play you had to audition. And it was like even the kids that And you like, was intrigued to audition for the play? It was nerve wracking. It was mm. it made me mad nervous. I, I auditioned my first time in the very first play of the year. I remember they, they set it over the PA system. Like, yeah, we have an audition. I'm like, yo, that'd be fun to do. When audition, the first play, kindergarten, didn't make it. All kindergarten didn't make it. I think I didn't make it the first two plays of first grade. That third play of first grade, I made it. And then after that, I never, I never didn't make it after that. But you had you had to like audition. full on audition in front of the two performing arts. I'm sorry, in front of the two drama teachers and all 100 kids that also wanted to be in the play. Mm. So it was real like, because you can imagine this you in kindergarten. Time at the Apollo. Really though. So you can imagine being first or uh, kindergarten in first or second grade, and you don't know most of the, you know some of them, but you don't know most of these kids. And you got to memorize a monologue or memorize a play and go up there. I'm sorry, not a play, a poem, and go up there and perform it. And not just recite it, but perform it and get these drama teachers to think you're good enough to be in the play. Exactly. So you're going to have to have them clapping it up for you. Yeah. Like, for real, for real. Like It was real cutthroat, bro. It was real. It, it was like, if people, if if you're old enough to remember trying out for your school's team and the list got posted on the wall and everyone went to check and if you didn't make it, everyone uh, knew you didn't make it. That was what it was. Because the my, list was posted. Because the list was posted. That was how it was in my performing arts school, bro. Mm. Like when you are in the same thing, the list got posted on the drama teacher's window. Like you went to go see, you didn't know what 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 uh, what part you got in the play, but you went to see like if you made it or not. And so well, once if your name was on it, at least you knew, okay, yeah. I got a part. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So yeah, that day. So I've been, this is, it, it, it's funny. Um, My sister-in-law, my, my, my older brother's wife, she like talks about like, this is like, when she found out that I went to perform in art school, she was like, that makes a lot of sense. Like your personality makes a lot of sense. And it makes a lot of sense. Like why you do a lot of the things that you do that you, like your formative years, you were at a performing art school. Mm. You know what I mean? So what you do in all the performance arts, what brought you to basketball? I know you said you was already doing it beforehand, but what brought you to then like being on an organized team and actually loving basketball? My older brother, mm -hmm. just you know, being a following after my older brother, just doing whatever he did. Yeah. If if my older brother never played basketball, I probably would have never played basketball. Yeah. If my older brother was like, you know what, I you know what, I think I want to make shoes, I probably would have been trying to make shoes too. Just right. just following after my older brother. Um and he was really good. Like the first time he picked up a ball, he was just a natural point guard. He was just really I guess good. before you even get in there, okay, okay. What, what inspired you to follow your older brother so much? Was it was it what he was putting on the table for you, or it was just like this is my older brother? And just him being my older brother, I just always thought he was cool. Um, I just, you know, I just always thought my older brother was cool. Just, right. He was older than me, like he was he was taller than me, he was bigger than me. He just just always thought my older right. and to this day, like I think I'm a pretty cool dude. Like I, I like the way I dress and the things that I do, but even like to this day, I find myself like still trying to impress my older brother. It's mm. it's so crazy, bro. Like to like I'm fully my own man. I'm fully my own person. Like and I've even seen from time to time my older brother like low key copying some of the things that I do. Mm -hmm. But even like to this day, I still like find myself trying to impress my older brother. It's, it's so crazy, bro. Do you feel like you have impressed him? He's or told me he's proud of me. Yeah, that is so on that level. Yeah. Do you yeah. feel like you have made do you feel like I know I know you said it, but do you actually believe he is proud of you? Yeah, I believe it. Oh, then that's yeah, good. I believe it. I believe it. Yeah. yeah. I, don't, I don't think he would lie to me. Yeah. yeah, for sure. Yeah, and I've and I've done I've done some I've done some pretty Yeah, I've done some pretty cool things in my life to where I feel like my brother could look at me and be like, yeah, you know what? My little brother's pretty cool, man. Yeah. You know what I mean? So yeah, I, th sure. I think I've done some things to make him proud for sure. Yeah. yeah so yeah. you said your older brother is what actually made you love the game of basketball. Mm -hmm. What position did you start off as? I was a point, I'm short, bro. I was I was always been a point guard mm -hmm. too. 
Well, my, bro- my brother was a point. But see, I've always been a point guard. My brother was like a natural, like really good passer, really could set people up. I've always just been really fast and I can get to the basket easily. Right. So like, but yeah, I've always played point guard. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What made you then feel like, okay, what what I, I, what got to the point where it was like, okay, basketball is not it for me neither? Oh, man, I knew that probably by like like sophomore year in high school. It was like, I, it was like, I enjoy this. I like it a lot, but it's, I don't, this, this probably ain't the route for me. You know was saying? it an injury or was it just like, I don't, you didn't feel like you had the talent that uh, that you've seen? I didn't like, feel like I had the talent, okay. honestly. Um, and it's funny. I tell like, and I when, I when I was coaching, I would tell kids like, when I was playing, I felt like, like I didn't know anything about like how these kids like go to like all these extra workouts and these private workouts and all. I didn't know anything about that. And it's always been a thing. It's not like it just started. It's right. always been a thing. Exactly. But I, I didn't know anything about that. Like, and I just figured you either got it or you don't. Because my older brother was really, really good at basketball, just naturally. As soon as he picked up a ball, he was just naturally good. And then my little brother, who's bigger than me and my older brother, he's the biggest out of the three of us. He's a, he was just naturally good at football from the first time he played. Mm-hmm. He just, just scoring touchdowns left and right. The same way my older brother could just set people up in basketball left and right. Right. And for me, like I was marginally good at basketball. I was marginally good at football, but they were standouts. You know, one was a standout at football, one was a standout exactly. at basketball. And they didn't go to any extra private workouts to be a standout. So like, wait, why, why can't I do that? Not necessarily why can't I do that. I just saw it as like, I ain't got it. Mm-hmm. I, oh, knew, okay. I knew I was, I knew I was good in music. I knew I was like like natural. Like I can play the, I can play the piano, but I can't read music. Like you I a could, different route. If I could sit with a song, like I can figure out how to play it on the piano. Mm-hmm. I've always been able to play the drums. I can make beats. I can write rhymes. And so I just felt like like naturally the arts, specifically music, is probably my thing. Mm-hmm. Athletics isn't my thing. They're naturals. Without even trying, they're good at it. So this is what they're supposed to do. Right. Without without even they were being gifted. really exactly. And so I looked at it like music. I don't really have to try very hard. Like I can grab, put a piano in front of me and give me a song. If I listen to it and play it over a million times for an hour, I can figure out how to play that song on the piano. Right. And so I felt like because this is naturally what I can do, this is what I'm supposed to do. Mm-hmm. Because it naturally, without them trying, that's what they're good at. Exactly. And so I felt like the arts, specifically music, was where I was supposed to be. Yeah. What got you into then pursuing a podcast? Um... Let alone actually just start off with what what got you into doing the the sports podcast because like like I like I told you earlier like this is like ESPN in San Diego so like what got you into like really being like okay I'm good at this doing my sports podcast yeah um and I know you venturing out to I don't even want to put you in a box to say it's a sports podcast because I know you venturing out to even do more than sports so actually take that back just your podcast period I appreciate that but no I don't I don't mind the question at all <clears throat> um. I, the sports podcast started because I actually met a guy. Well, I was already doing, I started my podcast because I was a big uh, fan of The Breakfast Club, specifically mm-hmm. Charlemagne the God. Right. Which is like, he just makes it look fun to like, it looks like he's not even working. Right. Like he's just kicking it, talking trash and just having fun all day. Right. I was like, I would love to do that. And I was just watching every interview Every interview that dropped, even if I don't, even if I didn't know the guest, I was just watching every interview, just soaking up some game. Uh huh. And I was like, that, just, that looks fun. Like I would love to do that. Like that looks really fun. And then he started a podcast. Like radio was like, you got to find a way to find it. I felt like I thought you had to find a way to get a job at a radio station. Mm-hmm. But then he started a podcast with this comedian named Andrew Schultz, and I was like, that is something I could do. Like you don't have to. You don't have to find a job. You don't have to know anybody to get a job at the radio station. You could just have a friend, have a microphone, have a camera, and you can do that. Right. And so I was like, yo, I got a job. I'm going to do that. I could buy a camera and a microphone. I'm going to do that. So it was between listening to Charlemagne's podcast and then also Joe Budden uh, started a podcast that I, I happened to find like randomly on my lunch break one day. I was already listening to Charlemagne's podcast. It's called The Brilliant Idiots. And then randomly on my lunch break one day, I was just like scrolling through SoundCloud and I found uh, Joe Budden's podcast. Actually, back then it was called- You found this through SoundCloud. SoundCloud. This is back in 2015, maybe 14, but a a long time ago. A while ago. ago. This is before it was called the Joe Budden Podcast. He used Uh to call it, I'll name this podcast later. 
Oh wow! So, so you were like way back, like you. Remember. I, I started listening maybe like episode fifteen. Mm. I mean, I was like, this is this is what I want to like. Not necessarily this is what I want to do with my life, but I want to do that. That looks fun. It sounds fun. I want to do that, mm. and so I I just started doing it. I, I I bought a camera. Well, I already had a camera because I was trying to shoot uh shoot my short film. So I already had a camera. Bought some mics, and then just just started rocking. I asked my brother if he wanted to do a podcast. Actually, no. My first podcast was right after I had my first son. It was called uh, My Hood Fatherhood, and it was just me talking about being a new dad, like mm-hmm. being a brand new dad, three months in, four months in, just talking about my journey through fatherhood. How old your son now? Uh, my son is six. Okay, he's six. Mm-hmm. Well, he'll be seven next month. Okay. Um, but in through doing that, I realized. Like, this is cool. Like, I like recording myself and putting it out. And, like, people are like, oh, I like that. And people chiming in on what I said. But I realized that what I wanted to do was what Charlemagne and Joe Budden was doing. Like, they're having conversations. Like, me, I was just recording my own voice into my phone and uploading it to SoundCloud. Right. And it was cool. But, like I said, the 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 fun in it for me was, like, what we're doing now. Like, I wanted to have a conversation. I wanted to converse. I wanted to speak with somebody. Exactly. And so, I like, I hit my brother and was like, yo, like, let's do a podcast. And he finally agreed to it. We started doing, we called it the, the Family Room Podcast. And this was, you invited him on the podcast or this was your co-host with you? This was my co-host. Okay. It wasn't my podcast. It was our podcast okay. together. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so we were, we were doing that. Um, we made it to like maybe 40, 50 something episodes and then we brought in- Damn, we did that many together. Yeah, we did a lot. Okay. We did a lot. And then we brought in, we brought in uh, my, my childhood friend, Jesse. I met him in seventh grade. We brought him in. Um, and we made it to like 66 or so episodes before it just kind of like COVID, like everybody like, so the bulk of like, like we brought my friend and we started doing a lot of the episodes at his house, the three of us. But then after COVID, they both kind of went back to work and I was still like, you know, freelancing photography and staying home with my mm-hmm. kids. So I, I was trying to like keep broadcasting. And so I, um, you know, found, you know, just different, different ways and, and different people to, to sit down and converse with. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I started the podcast because. I seen Charlemagne first and then Joe Button doing a podcast and was like, yo, that looks fun. I want to do that. Right. What type of, I guess, uh, response did you get from starting a podcast? Um, it was good. The, the, when the I start- response that you got when you started it and basically the love you get now. Oh, it's way different now. It's way different now just because people are more... In tune with what you've been doing. In tune with what I've been doing, but also more familiar with what a podcast is. Right. Because back like before it was like, people knew like, there was enough podcasts to know what a podcast was, but still it was like, ah, like. What is this? Like for what? Like you. Yeah, why am I listening to this? Yeah. Like you brought some cameras to your living room and now you want me to watch that? Like for yeah. what? You know what I mean? But now people have more of an understanding of what a podcast is and they see the 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 value in it. So the, the response is. I don't want to say it's night and day because we we had good responses early on. People people enjoyed what we were doing, but was it what you expected initially? Yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. I thought there would be. Were you expecting much, or you wasn't expecting much? I wasn't expecting much. Okay, I wasn't expecting much. I expected more people to tap in initially than they did. Than, than did. Mm. I expected more people to tap in, but that's you know, like I come from. Like making music, so I know people are. It may take a while. It or may not take a while. People, catch. people, people can be fickle. They might be like, they might even if they like it, they might not vocalize it until someone else exactly. does. You know what I'm saying? So uh, I that's, wasn't. That's funny too. I get it. I get it. I, I understand how mm-hmm. how it works. You know what I'm saying? I wasn't. I wasn't tripping. Yeah. What? How? How has fatherhood changed your life? It just. Gave me more focus. Um, it's focus as, as far as goals. Or yeah. Focus as far as what? Focus is um, goals. Goals as far as goals, but it's funny, man. Like whenever, like I have this conversation with people, <clears throat> I feel kind of guilty because, like, having becoming a father, it made me. It was like, yo, I got a mouth to feed. Like, I need to, I need to be going harder. But it didn't like. Outside of that, it didn't really change me, and I feel even guilty saying that out loud because I have plenty of friends that like, after becoming a dad, they felt like this big change in them that like, like yo, like. 
but for whatever reason, I like I, I love my kids. And I don't think you should feel guilty because everybody's story ain't the same. And like you said, you love your kids and you take care of your kids, so there should be no guilt. Mm -hmm. I mean, other than I mean, I, because of the story you always hear, everybody always tell like, oh man, when I had my kid, that changed my life, and I I started doing this different, I started doing this, but. Like, you, I mean, maybe for you, you already had the mentality mm -hmm. of how hard you got to work mm -hmm. for this and this and that. So mm -hmm. I don't feel in any sense you should even feel guilty about you saying that behind that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and you know, I mean, I, it goes without saying, but just to be clear, like I I love my kids, like my kids are my life. Like I have two boys, mm -hmm. you know what I mean. And there's a lot of pride in that because I guess my 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 dad only had boys. Exactly, he had three. I only have two, but like to to follow what my dad did and like only have boys, there's a lot of pride in that. And I love my kids. Like, my kids are my life. Like, my, if I could, I would bring my kids here. Like, mm -hmm. I, I I want my kids with me all the time. But, like, I have a kid, like, my boy Isaac, he just had a son. And just, like, listening to him talk and, like, about, like, like I had a, a, this big sense of pride and this big sense of motivation. But I'm, like, listening to him talk, I'm like, I don't think I ever sounded like that. Like, mm -hmm. I don't know if I ever felt like that. But I I, I always... I always wanted to be a dad and I always knew I would be a dad. Um, but I didn't necessarily like after having like when my girl got pregnant, it wasn't like like, yo, like I need to all right, all right. It wasn't it wasn't like that. I was proud and I was happy and I couldn't wait for my first kid to get here. But it didn't like man, I still feel guilty even saying it. It didn't make me like it didn't like a flip. A, a switch wasn't flipped or like a, a mentality wasn't changed or like it didn't like make me a new person. It was just more like, yo, I got a mouth to feed. I need to be going harder than I'm going right now. That was the only change. But like all my life, like I couldn't, I couldn't wait to have kids. And I know like usually it's women that say that, but I really like, especially as like I started to like, like, like 20, like two, 23, 24, it was like, yeah, I, can, I really can't wait to like, get married and have kids and start that part of my life. Mm -hmm. So may maybe that's why, because it was like, it was, that was always like in the plan. It was something that right. I always like really, really wanted to do. I don't know, but I have, honestly, I've, I've felt guilt. Like when like my, my boy Jotham or my boy Isaac, like different friends or different people in my life when they have kids and they talk about like this mentality change and this flip, this switch that was flipped that I, I didn't have that. Mm -hmm. I, I, I don't know why, but I didn't have that. And do you still feel that guilt? And even looking back, I mean, how how much you've taken care of your children still is like, do you still have that guilt because you didn't feel like you had that switch that everybody else talks about? A little bit of guilt. Not not I it's not anything that I think about. I guess only when I when I speak when you about voice it, it. Yeah, when I speak about it, it it forces me to think about it and I feel a little bit guilty. But it's it's not like a guilt that I carry with me every day. Okay, it's not good. like I look okay. at my kids and I feel guilty or anything. It's I never literally never think about it until I'm speaking about it. Right. Like, so yeah, like nah, like nah. I feel I feel like I'm a good dad. Like I feel like I'm of I feel like I'm a great dad. Yeah. Yeah. What has now inspired you to take your podcast outside of sports? Um well, I always had the... Um, Cause I'm like, you said you always wanted to have a conversation, so mm -hmm. maybe that's one more so. I always had the, like, like a, I'm a, I always had the, I always had the other show where, um, so I have a show, I have a, I have a few shows, so I don't know. Definitely get those out there. Okay, boom. So I have like my sports show that we've been speaking about, On the Mic with Michael Flicks, where I interview players, coaches, you know, athletic directors, Anybody within the owners of teams, anybody within the sports world, agents, I've interviewed a couple of agents, anybody within the sports world, I interview them. That's that's for the sports show. Mm -hmm. And then I have another show. So that show is called On the Mic with Michael Flicks. That's the sports show. Right. Then I have another show called Link Up with Michael Flicks, where it's very similar to what you do, mm -hmm. where like I'll go like how you're in, you're at, you're at my studio right now talking to me, like right. in my story. My link up show is literally the exact same thing. Right. Like I would I would pull up on you and talk to you about like why do you want to broadcast and why do you do your thing? Yeah. Like I've interviewed different different artists. Um my guy uh uh Turn Up Vegan on Instagram. He he used to have oh, the yeah. um, he has Spoiled Vegans Cafe, um different di you know, different entrepreneurs, different artists. Um my boy uh Brandon, he has a clothing line called Trill Consciousness. I interviewed him about like his journey to starting his clothing line and mm -hmm. everything like that. And so um I've 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 had a you know a, a few different shows, but to answer the question, my 
my curiosity is much more than just sports. Right. Like I'm very, I'm very interested in like when I see an athlete, like I'll see him perform. And a lot of times you hear the questions like, oh, like what, what went into tonight's performance? Like, what did you, what do you attribute to tonight's 40 point game? And though that's a good question. Like it needs to be asked. But a lot of the time I want to know, like. What did you even go through to have to get to this 40 yeah. point game? Or like, what did, what did your girl say to you? Yeah. Like, did your, did your, did your son say like, hey dad, inspired like. inspired you to do like, that. Like what, I want to know, like, I want to know more. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. I want to know more like the, the interview and no disrespect to any post game or pregame interview. But like you, you get what you get from it, and it's really just about the game. Mm-hmm. But for me, a lot of the times, I'm curious about the person outside of the sport. I'm curious about the artist outside of the studio, and so that made me like, like, yeah, I love these interviews that I see. Excuse me, I love these interviews that I see, but I, I want to know more. And at that point, when you were asking him about his mom, and then y'all pivoted and started talking about the album again, I had another question about his mom. Right. I had another question about his brother. You know what I mean? And so that that also made me be like, I want to start my own show. And so like the questions that I have when they go back to the main thing, the questions that I still have, I'm going to start a show and I'm going to ask those questions. Mm-hmm. What type of support have you got now starting that other realm of your podcast? Um, marginal. Marginal support. Um, the people that... No, that's not true. I've gotten good support. I've gotten good support. I, I I guess I said marginal just because the uh You were expecting more? Expecting more just as far as like like I'll put I'll put something out. Like people because people know me like majority for like what I do is like sports content. Right. And so like if I put something out outside of that, it doesn't it doesn't do the numbers that the sports content does. But right. I'm not necessarily a numbers guy. Like I'm in it, like I, I just I'm in it for the love, like I'm in it for the journey. Mm-hmm. Um and so like when I said when I said Support, I was thinking in that way, but like now, like the majority of the people that I reach out to, they're open to sitting with me and talking with me and they appreciate uh, a lot of the time, a lot of people that I've interviewed, they'll be like, don't like, bro, that was the best interview I've done. Like a lot of people have like come and like pulled up on me, but I've never like had like a real in-depth interview like that. And so like, I, I think the, the support's been there. The support- what's the in-depth interview to you? Cause like you said, you've been doing the interview. So what's more so in-depth to you? Just digging deeper, like mm-hmm. like like what we're doing now. Just like digging deeper, like not just like oh, like not that surface level right. talk where you just say this and then like, on to the next. Okay, he got that. Okay, next question. Next question. Okay, right. It's like I know, <clears throat> like you you film basketball. Like what's what's the 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 biggest name player you've ever filmed before? Mm-hmm. And it's like it's a it's a sure it's a valid question. It's a fair question, but someone could easily go to my page and, and see, see that and easily answer that question for right. themselves. And so to me, while like if someone were to ask that question, I wouldn't be like, bro, that question sucks. Or this is a terrible issue. That's right. You're going to answer it. I'm going to answer it. And I'm going to appreciate it because it's a part of the, like I ask, I ask questions that people would probably know the answer to mm-hmm. as a part of like on the way to get into the heavy hitting questions. Of course. But to answer to the To leave it there. You, exactly. It's like, but to answer you your question, do justice. Exactly. So to answer your question, what's an in-depth interview is to, we're going to get to those two. We're gonna ask those questions, but we're gonna to get to the deeper stuff too. Mm-hmm. We're gonna to, we're gonna get we're gonna dig a little deeper into why you're doing what you're doing, what went into what you're doing, what's gonna happen next, why you chose this. Just like more of like I'm a exactly. very curious, I'm a very nosy guy, mm-hmm. and so like just any of the nosy questions that I got in my head, I would ask them. And, right. And so to me, that's what an in depth an in depth interview. I see is. what you're saying. Yeah. What it what what it that what was that feeling like for you when you and I don't know if that was the first time, but what was that like feeling for you when you seen LeBron James? Oh shit, I was hella over here. What was that feeling like for you when you seen LeBron James? So I had the opportunity to film LeBron James at the. That was the year. first time. Yeah. Okay. Well, no. Um, up close. Okay. Up okay. close. I went to um when he was still in Cleveland. I went to a Cleveland versus Clippers game when when uh, Chris Paul was still in playing for the Clippers. Okay. But that's like everyone. A lot of people. I don't want to say everyone. A lot of people have had that experience, um, but it was dope, man. So the experience that you're talking about, I got, I had the opportunity to film LeBron at the Drew League over the summer, All right? Um, and it was really dope. It was, it was really, really, really dope, man. Um, being like being on the baseline, it, and so that whole that whole day is pretty crazy. That whole day is pretty crazy. So I was, I was supposed. He to, wasn't the only one there. Exactly. Exactly. Right. And we spoke a little bit off camera. But yeah. Um, I was I almost didn't make it to that. I was supposed to work here in town. I canceled work to go be at that. Right. 
and we made it there. And so the word when word gets out that LeBron is going to be somewhere, you can only imagine. And it's not the Staples Center where you can hold half of LA, not half of LA, but you can hold thousands of people. Right. This is a high school gym. Right. You know what I'm saying? Where the it's, it's come limited. On. Yeah, very, very limited. For the people that want to see LeBron for free, because the Drew, Le, the Drew League is for free. Mm-hmm. As long as you get there on time, you get a seat, it's for free. And people know that. And so, like, get to see LeBron play basketball for free is once in a lifetime. I got to pull up. And so the line is crazy, stupid long, miles long. Right. I'm exaggerating, but the line is dumb long. Right. I get there. I want to say, let's say if the game is at one, I get there. I get to LA at 12 30, 12 45. And the line is wrapped around the building. Um, not even wrapped around the building. They're like you wouldn't believe how long how long this line was. Right. You wouldn't believe it. Um, and so I get who should I say this? Should I tell now I'm gonna tell it. Forget that. I'm gonna tell it. <laughs> I'm gonna tell it. Um and so I used to work on the media staff on the the I used to work on the media staff for the for the Drew League. Like I used okay. to be one of the camera people for the Drew League. And so I have I had last year's official media badge. They change it every year, but I had last year's official like Drew right. League media badge. And all and just because I'm a weirdo like that, any media badge that I've ever gotten since I started my photography career, I have all of them. I've right. never thrown one away. That's a memory. I have all of them. Even like the smallest ones that mean Nothing to right. get into the smallest event. I have that's all to look back on and be like, man, I remember I went to this. I've never event. thrown a single one away, mm-hmm. and so I still. And the, and the Drew League one is like, of course you want to keep that one, and so I got it. And I'm like, I'm running late. I'm like, this might come in handy. I'm gonna bring it with me, right? And so I, I come, and like I said, the line is long enough. All of LA is in this line. I get there, I get there, and uh, I get up to the door. And it's, it's like glass doors. All the people inside could see you outside. I get to the door. And I'm like, dang. Like, I don't know how I'm going to do this. I'm like, I, it's the only chance. Let's, I, let's, let's give it a whirl. It's the only way I could do it. So I take out last year's media badge. And I've never told this story before. I take out last year's media badge. And I, like, I knock on the door. And they like almost like like wave me away. Like, we're no, we not letting nobody else in. And I pull a badge out. And I show them. And I, like, I point to it. And they open the door. And they're like, like. Who are you here with? And I won't, won't. Well, yeah, you don't need to drop no names. But I was like, yeah, I'm yeah. with, I'm with, I'm with so and so. I'm with so and so. Like, I'm, I'm here to film. They like, okay, bet. They let me. I'm like, oh, bet. Man, that worked. So I'm going. But for big games at the Drew League, you need a certain type of media badge to stand on the baseline. Otherwise, you got to be like in the stands where your footage isn't going to be as good. Yeah. And I'm standing on the baseline. And I'm like, man, they're going to come jam me up because I ain't got the one that you need to be on the baseline. I got last year's badge. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? But And so so I get on the baseline working. That's a lot of people. There's too many people over there for them, to, for them to really police. And so it's like, luckily, I was able to stay there. I had the perfect, like, of any, in my opinion, of any photographer that was on the baseline, I had the perfect spot, bro. Like, mm-hmm. the perfect spot. And I'm standing, like, mad firm because ain't nobody finna Yo, move yeah. me. Like, this is my spot. I'm not moving. Man, they end up because... There's so many VIP seats at the Drew League. They ended up bringing in more seats on the baseline where I was sitting, so I had to move. And I was I was sitting down on the baseline like I'm not moving. Yeah. They ended up bringing chairs in right there, so I had to I had to move to the side first. I'm to the side. Then they made me stand up, and so now I'm standing up, and I'm like I said, it's VIP seats. They sit Khalil Mack. Oh damn! In the chair right in front of me. Yeah. Like. Right there. Khalil Mack's head is right here. I filmed the entire, filmed LeBron the entire game right over Khalil Mack's head. Like like my camera was literally right over his head the entire time. Yeah. I mean, I actually like bumped it, like bumped his hair a couple of times. Did that make you nervous? Hell yeah. Yeah. So this dude is worth millions and I keep bumping into him and like he, first couple of times I bumped him, he kind of like looked up at me and like maybe like that third or fourth time he like turned and looked at me like, all right, bro, like that, like. Like, okay, you Whatever you gotta do, lot, figure bro. it out. Don't bump me no more, yeah. bro. So it was like, I gotta make sure I don't bump him no more. You know what I'm saying? But it was it was a really it was a really dope experience, man. It was really the celeb like Draymond Green was there, celebrities all over the place. LeBron played well. Um, it was dope, man. It felt it felt like it was it was just another Drew League game, but it, it felt like a like the championship game. It was mm-hmm. dope. It was dope. The energy in the building was crazy. I've never in my photography career, I don't think I've been. A part of anything that 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 felt like so that. that magnitude. Nah, not nothing. So w- what you shooting now, like something big like that, 
and then shooting something that you was like, say, like you're doing a regular at high school or something like that. Does the work ethic change between that or it's the same or energy change between that? No, it's the same. It's the same. You don't, you don't, you don't feel the same hype, obviously, but now you got to be, you got to be locked in the same way. You got to be, because I mean, people are, people pay you to come out and people pay you to do something. You got to put your best foot forward. Mm -hmm. So yeah, the, um. Yeah, the focus is there. The, the 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 energy is there. I can't lie though. Like knowing that, like, no, let me not say that. The focus is there. The mm -hmm. focus is there. Yeah. 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 So now, with you, how doing? Went through all the ups and downs. How how do you manage your mental health? Good question, man. Because <clears throat> like like I said, we all go through it. So I, like I always I always ask this to people because I really be wondering how. Every, because everybody go through everything else different. So it's like, I really be wondering, how do you personally manage your mental health? I haven't been managing it well recent, um, as of late, honestly. I've been doing, I want to say in the last, I want to say in the last month or so, I've made more of like, <clears throat> made more of like a concerted effort to like be better with my mental health. But I've been, I haven't been good at it at all. I've been really just, I don't want to say just because it's not a good excuse. I've been focused on the work and trying to progress and get better and get out as much content as I can that I haven't really. Dealing with a daily lifestyle. I haven't given the the energy to my mental health that I need to. And I'm I'm paying for it now. Right. Honestly. I'm in what sense do you feel like you paying for it now? I'm I'm a, I'm I'm a little bit depressed right now. Like I'm I'm dealing with a little bit of depression right now. The fact that you're depressed and you still here, that's like that's even major. Maybe that's in the sense of you carpent um carpent compartmentalizing. Yeah, there you go. You, mm -hmm. you got you saved me on that one. Mm -hmm. That and putting that to the side, but the fact that you were still here and like you just said, like I'm going through some depression right now is like mm -hmm. that's that's already a big that's major. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, this this is what I love. This is like sometimes it it, it takes like knowing that. Like, like we here at Flix Media Studios, right? And knowing that like every time I come here, I gotta set up. I'm not yet to the to the space where like I can leave my studio and I can just leave all my equipment up. Mm -hmm. I can't do that yet. Right. And so like a lot of the time, it's like a struggle to to fight through just getting here. Cause like once I sit down like this, I love this part. Right. This I could do this all day. Right. Like I even had to tell your producer, I could I could sit here until two o'clock in the morning, bro. This is what I love. I could I could do this all day. Mm -hmm. But getting here, like setting up the camera, setting up the audio, getting the getting the visual right, make sure these these couches are situated right, that the background looks good. Right. Like that, like the the behind the scenes of getting set up can be a daunting task. Like it's that part I don't enjoy. I don't necessarily love. I don't enjoy that part of it. Mm -hmm. But I'm I'm learn I'm trying to learn to enjoy it because it is a part of the journey and so i'm trying to like learn to like not like begrudge that part of it um but but to answer your question like not nah, like nah that i've been like in and that the depression part like I'll, that's the part that i think about when i like when i come in here to like set up to do a show or like do a podcast mm -hmm. i think like man, i don't feel like setting up all them cameras man. i don't feel like setting up them lights i don't feel like setting up them mics I don't feel like putting my background up. I don't feel like doing all of that. Like, mm -hmm. I just don't. I don't. And then, honestly, I see you pumping out, you know, doing three interviews in one day, and I see you always cooking, always cooking. I'm like, yo, I need to get like, bro, like, dude ain't stopping. Like, and I, that's the bag I used to be in. Mm -hmm. I used to be in that, like, I didn't, there was no stop, no depression, no sadness. Like, whatever I got to do, I'm going to get it done. And for like, just recently, like, like, just dealing with stuff in my personal life, dealing with stuff in my professional life, it's like, you know, just dealing with a little bit of you know a little bit of depression and it makes yeah. me like I don't I just don't the 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 extra stuff that it not the extra stuff it's not extra it's the necessary things the necessary things that go into setting up a broadcast can be a little bit daunting and it's like I don't feel like doing all of that but I do it and I, mm -hmm. I fight through it and I I I still love and enjoy what I do mm -hmm. it's probably a really long way to answer my bad no that wasn't and like I, I, like I always tell everybody I'm on here with, like there is nothing. I'm not asking you something because I'm expecting you to be like, oh, wrap that shit up quick. Like that's that's not what I'm on here for. Because honestly, on some real shit, like how you said you feel like you love coming here, so I want to be an outlet for somebody that 
love coming here to speak with me. So like for me, myself, for you to even, that's why you said like, it was a long winded answer. Like not at all. Like that's, that's the best. One, Cause that was, that's a real one. That's what you was really feeling. Mm -hmm. And you had to get all that out. So not, no, not at all. Appreciate it. So now like with, um, <clears throat> you did the LeBron, who was something behind the else like you would feel like, I mean, obviously, like you said, like if you look at the catalog, you'd be like, oh, LeBron, like that, that's the top one. Who was somebody that you feel like that you have interviewed or shot that you felt like, man, this one, I really enjoyed this one? Mm -hmm. Nobody. You, I'm sure you got a catalog anyway, so. Yeah, I was about to say, like, nobody, I haven't, Paul Rudy. Paul Rudy from uh, from KUSI, Prep Pigskin Report. I interviewed him on my sports show, and he was like, he was an interview that I would really like. It was like, I don't want to say a bucket list, but he was a checklist interview for me. Like me being from San Diego, doing broadcasting in San Diego. There were three people that I was like, I want to interview Paul Rudy for sports. I want to interview Mitchie Slick. The rapper, and mm -hmm. I want to, and I want to interview Norman Powell. I mean, it's also sports, but he's an NBA champion, and I do a lot of basketball. It's content. due for Portland. He used to play for Portland. Now he moved. He plays for the Clippers now. Yeah, yeah, but he won a championship when he played for Toronto with Kawhi Leonard. Mm -hmm. Um, and he he went to Lincoln High School. Right. He went oh, to okay. Lincoln. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so those were like my three: Paul Rudy, Mitchie Slick, and Norman Powell. I've I've been saying for years those are like my three San Diego interviews that are like those are like my my dream San Diego interviews. How many of them have you checked off the list? Now? I was able to get Paul Rudy. Uh huh. Um, last I want to say a little bit before, like last summer, mm -hmm. and that was like a, that was a really a really really big deal for me. I didn't get to ask him everything I wanted to ask him because we ran out of time. But the fact that like he, and you could always get them back on there for exactly, the second one exactly. And Paul Rudy's like as far as like like shows and like sports broadcasting here in San Diego, he's the top dog. Like mm -hmm. Prep Pigskin Report is like. It's a big deal. Right. You know what I mean? And he created that show. He's the host and the anchor of that show. Um, and so to, to to have him on the show, was it was a really big deal. It was a really a, a milestone moment for me. So I really- Was he as open as you wanted him to be? Absolutely. Okay, good. Absolutely. We only didn't get to everything just because we ran out good of time. time. But yeah, anything that I asked him, he 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 answered it very open. Mm. He, wasn't, he wasn't guarded at all. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And now- you said, uh, and that that'll probably also go into like with you now doing um, link up with, with Michael Flicks. You get Mitchy Stick on there. <clears throat> How hard has it been to even trying to get in touch with him? It hasn't been hard, man. I've it hasn't been hard. It hasn't been hard. Um, I put it out. I've been putting it out for a while. I've been tweeting it. I've been putting it in my Instagram story that those were the three guys that I wanted. Like those mm -hmm. are my three big name guys that I wanted. Um, Oh, you know what? And before I keep going, I, I want to add another name to that. He's his name isn't on the level of those three guys, but I also want to interview Jelani McCoy. He's a, a NBA veteran from right here in San Diego, and he he went to UCLA with uh, Baron Davis. Okay. Um, and he's a producer on All the Smoke with um Steven oh, wow. Jackson and Matt Barnes. He's a behind the scenes producer for their show. And he's Dago. And he's from here yeah he's from here played for the lakers played no, i don't know played for the supersonics i don't remember all his nba teams but he's graduated played basketball and graduated from ucla played for the supersonics for a little bit and he's a like a certified nba vet right and he works as a producer for on the smoke i want to interview him yeah like he, he's like i've met him once like i met him at the uh, tory pines holiday classic i met him and shook his hand one time but he's just been like a, um like a distant, like behind the scenes mentor. Like whenever, like I could DM him and tap in, like, "Hey, OG, I need. Like, what do you think about this? Like, how should I? I could always tap in with him. So I definitely, yeah. like I said, he's not like a Norman Powell, like or a, you know what I'm saying? But he's somebody to you, absolutely. And I, I'm sure to other people as well, absolutely. So I definitely want to have him on the show. I forgot why I was going. I went on a tangent. What was the? What was your question? We went to Mitchy Slick. How you? How hard has it been to get in touch with him? You um, so I put it out. <clears throat> I put it out that I wanted him. Um, that I wanted to interview him. Um, and one of my friends was like, hey, bro, I can help with that, bro. And he I, he, he screenshotted my, my my Instagram story, and I sent it to his uncle that is from Nipsey's section. I guess he knows Nipsey personally. He's from uh, Nipsey. <laughs> he's from Mitchie's, Nipsey, he's from Mitchie's uh, yeah. section. And I guess like he was like, yo, bro, I'm going to help you get this done. And he showed the message to Mitch. And then the next day, uh, Mitchie reached out to me. He was like, what's up, youngin? Like, what you need? And I told him, I was like, hey, bro, like, I'm a, I do broadcasting out here in town. Like, 
I've actually like met you at a couple like Lincoln games before. Like you're like a dream interview of mine. Like I really want to have you on the show. He's like, yeah, bro, let's set it up, let's do it. And then like that that was as far as it went at this point. Mm-hmm. And he's a busy guy. Like I'm not like holding it against him. Right. right. He's a busy guy, but like we've I've I've DM'd him at least. Like we've gone back and forth. Like, he knows that I want him on the show. Right. So. And why is it that you want Mitchy Slick so much on on the slow? He's, on the San, show? he's a San Diego legend. He's mm-hmm. a staple. He's a staple in the city. And I'm all about I'm all about San Diego and broadcasting San Diego and, and shining the light and giving a platform to San Diego. Not that he needs my platform. He's of he's Mitchy Slick. Um, but just him being a San Diego legend and a staple in the and not just in San Diego, but in the inner city in Southeast. Like he be he was just at Lincoln's game last Friday. Like he, Lincoln going crazy. Yeah, yeah. They they probably gonna win state. They going crazy. Yo, yo, shout out to the hive, man. They shout out to the hive. They they doing big thing. They probably gonna win state. But um, yeah, yeah, he he knows that I'm I'm sure he would like if you told him like, hey yo, Michael Flicks wants you on the show, he wouldn't be like, Oh yeah, I know. You'd have to be like, Who? Michael Flicks? Mm-hmm. Like who? Like, oh boy, da 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 da. And then he'd be like, Oh yeah, okay, but yeah. we've 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 reached out, we've we've I've reached out and we've we've gone back and forth exactly. in the DMs. Had conversations. He knows that I want him on the show. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And Norm, Norman Powell does too, actually. Oh damn. Yeah. I've uh, I've I filmed. I took pictures for him at he does his uh, understand the grind camp. Okay. At his high school every year. Oh. And I've uh, I took pictures at like the I think the second one that he did, and then um, a friend of his had an event a co- a few years back. Or no, no, not even a few years back. Like a few months back, and Norman Powell was in town for that. That's dope that that yeah. that you even still connected with all those events and it's like oh no I know that that's going on I know this person's gonna be here somebody hit me up to be there and that that just that just comes from me being you know just being a genuine guy and meeting people bro mm-hmm. like I'll be out with my camera in my hand all the time so people know that I'm working but just being a being a, a genuine guy and just being a support like anybody I support I support everybody if you're mm-hmm. doing anything positive I'm gonna support you right so people know me to be genuine and be a supporter and so they're like oh yep. Yeah. Tell Flicks to come out. Like, mm-hmm. Tell Flicks to pull up. And so I've I've had a few enough of those relationships to where people like it started as like you know what do him a favor and like tell him to pull up. And now it's to the point where like nah people like want my they want him they, to they come want up. me there they yeah. want me to they want me to cover they want me to interview they want me to film. So mm-hmm. it's been it's been a blessing for real. Definitely. What's your basically like your ideal camera? I want that red man. I want that red camera. That that, that I want that red camera. That's. I think most anybody that work with camera, I'm pretty sure your your, your producer probably tell you too. That red camera is. I've never even shot with it before. I've only seen. I've worked on projects and seen other people shooting with it, and obviously I've seen footage from it. But if I can get that red camera, man, that's that'd be the one. Pretty much all like the. Now let me not say that because I don't know it like that. But a lot of the the high quality content and specifically interviews that I watch is yeah. it's shot on a red camera for sure. And that's the quality. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. You can like kind of like make something look like that or like kind of mimic it or copy right. it. But but yeah. if you, like you said, if I got a choice, yeah. I want the red camera. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For sure. Yeah, yeah. So shit, while I still got you on here, is there anybody that you wanted to sh- uh, mm-hmm. shout out? Any socials you wanted to put out there? Any new things you got coming up? Because like I said, I'm always loving the highlight San Diego and everything they got going on out here. So if I like people watching this, I would love people to know how they'd be able to reach you and anything else you got going. Yes. I would love to shout out I would love to shout out my podcast co-host. She's super dope. She's gonna be a su- she's gonna be a star man. Her name is Sarah B. Um she has a show called Say No Mas. You can find her actually on Instagram Congos. It's like C O N G O O S S something like that. She's my podcast host. Come to my podcast page, you'll find her. Um, and what was the other thing you said? Shout out and what else? Your socials or there anything you new you got coming up, anything like that. I am about to get my link up show back on back back up and running. I actually got an interview tomorrow night that I'm shooting. That's anyway. I'm about to get my link up show back up and going and my sports show back up and going. Like mm-hmm. I said, I've been not even going front, bro. Dealing with this depression is kind of like had me just kind of doing the bare minimum but I'm kind of I'm I'm, I'm shaking it. I'm getting back but I'm and the shaking pressure it. really came from you just wanting like man like I don't want to set up no 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 <laughs> good question I'm glad yeah. you I'm glad you asked that to give me a chance to clarify no 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 my depression didn't come from like damn I gotta set up my cameras and my lights and my mics no my the depression the mild and that it's not anything super deep mm-hmm. the mild depression that I'm dealing with is come from things 
in my personal life that I don't necessarily okay. want to share right no, now. No, and, that, but, and that's um, never the case. Yeah, so it's definitely yeah. come from things in my oh, Okay, life. okay. But just okay. like dealing with that depression, like, oh my God, just top like of that. being in like this sluggish, like just moving slow and doing the bare minimum. That's it's come from things in my personal life. Not okay. not from I can okay. I can I can if they, if things are going great, I could thug through setting up cameras and okay. lights and all that. Like, okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay, but yeah. I'm glad you asked that. Give me a chance to clarify. I definitely no, want people like, nigga, you depressed because you gotta set up cameras. No, nah, no, nah, that's why you I, don't I, grow up. Like like you said, like if I got a question, I'm going definitely. Asked, so. I appreciate you asking yeah, that. Definitely. Yeah, definitely, because that would have been that would have been. I appreciate you asking. No that. doubt. Um, but now we were touching on on the socials they can reach you at, and now you now you about to be back on your uh, with the podcast. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. So so both my shows are coming back. Link up with Michael Flicks on the mic with Michael Flicks. Both of those shows are coming back. You can find them on my YouTube channel. That's um, the Flick Flicks Media Network YouTube channel, not the. Flix Media Network YouTube channel on on, on YouTube, um, Michael Flix M I C H A E L period F L I X X. Just one X. I'm sorry. Just one X. <laughs> that's, that's my email. That's my email. My bad. I'm getting all messed up. Two two X's on the email, but M I C H A E L period F L I X on the Instagram, and uh, yeah, that's it. Yeah, everything I do. If you if you find me on Instagram, you'll find everything else that mm-hmm. I do. So yeah, that's for it. sure. That's pretty much it. Well, definitely. It's been another episode of the Big Umbrella Podcast, and it's a wrap. Appreciate you, fam. For sure. Well, let's get some tacos, nigga. Can we really get some tacos? <laughs> you trying to get some tacos? Let's get some tacos, nigga.